All right, okay. go ahead. Welcome to uh, this week's conversation. Uh, we're talking about immediate resources and what's next with government. I wanna first thank our team here at Kiln. We've had a tremendous effort behind the scenes to put these information sessions together. Really appreciate um, uh, Brighton right, and Brighton Welcome and, to uh, this week's Brighton, conversation. Annie, and Noah. Oh, hold on. We're talking. Brighton, Annie, and Noah for putting uh, the information out there and helping us to get coordinated on this call. We have today with us um, Congressman John Curtis and le Legislative Assistant Brian Fahey uh, from the, from, at the federal level. We have President Stuart Adams, President of the Utah State Senate um, with us from the state, state level and uh, Mayor Mendenhall, uh, recent, recent Mayor Mendenhall joining us from Salt Lake City. You just jumped right into the, uh, into the deep end as a new mayor, didn't you? Yes, <laughs> quite. Yeah, well, you're swimming quite nicely and we're, we're impressed with the work that you're doing. I wanna just um, say that this session is designed to be as technical as possible. We're trying to give real practical information and um, forward-looking information to small businesses. Specifically, we're focused on businesses that are between zero and 50 employees, um, but this, this information could be relevant to lots of uh, businesses. We are, we're, uh, as Kiln, we're focused primarily on tech companies, but we do have others that are gonna be listening in today. And the last thing I wanna just share is that there's been a, a tremendous amount of work and information that's come out over the last couple of days about SBA loans, um, specifically the EIDL and the, the Payroll Protection Plan. These, uh, the PPP loan actually in, in theory should go live today, but there's some uh, glitches still being worked out, I think um, between the SBA and some of the lenders. And so hopefully those loans start getting processed early. For anybody that's listening, I would encourage you to go to siliconslopes.com um, and you can also connect through Silicon, uh, Silicon Slopes or serve Silicon, no, Silicon Slopes serve. And you should definitely be looking at the information that's been posted there on the various loan options and how you can access them. We'll probably touch on those loans in this conversation, but the, today's conversation is not gonna be focused on SBA loans, um, but we're gonna focus more broadly on other resources that are coming out that are immediately available, as well as what's coming next from government. So what is it that is being developed at the federal, state, and local levels that's in the works, in the background being talked about, um, that is going to be relevant to early stage companies um, and that's gonna be on the, the top of their minds and the agendas that they're working on. So with that being said, I'd like to turn the time over to Congressman Curtis. If you can uh, give us uh, your quick view on the state of play, immediate resources that you wanna make sure businesses are aware of and talk to us about what the conversations are that are happening back in Washington right now about what's coming next, what comes after these, uh, these immediate stimulus um, packages. Excellent. Uh, so great to be with you today and uh, appreciate you putting this together. Uh, let me um, start by expressing a concern that I'm hearing on a, a pretty regular basis. And as I, as I do this, I want you to picture in your mind the people in line at the grocery stores buying bottles of water, right? And buying the toilet paper. And, and in essence, we have plenty of toilet paper. We have plenty of boiled uh, of, of water, right? But there's this panic that we don't. And, and I feel the same way about the legislation that Congress has passed. There, there's this, this dialogue going around that there is not enough money there for our small businesses. The reality of it is I cannot sit here. I don't think anybody on the planet can sit here and tell you there is enough. And, and anybody that tells you that there is not enough also has no information to tell you that. We're in a world where we simply don't know what's happening. None of us saw this coming. Uh, none of us have a playbook. Congress has taken a massive swing at this. And for small businesses, I, I want people to know this bill really started with small businesses being the nucleus uh, of this. And how do we help small businesses? The best tools that we could come up with have been implemented in this bill. We possibly don't have enough money in there. I want people to know that, that have confidence that Congress will act accordingly. We don't want to lose our small businesses. Congress is very in tune with that. 
The problem is we wouldn't know what the next step is to take right now if we were getting together and saying, okay, well, we're gonna start the next step. We just lack way too much information about this. So those of you who, um, if you've not contacted your financial institution, I think you've made a tactical mistake and you need to make that phone call today. You need to start getting in the queue. You need to start learning what's available to you. Uh, understand that they're going to be overwhelmed. I talked with one banking institution. They're expecting 100,000 loans. So understand they're going to be overwhelmed, but that's all the more reason to call and get in that queue uh, quickly. There has been talk about a fourth bill, but at this point, it is simply talk. Uh, nobody knows what would be in that. Nobody knows how that would come together. Nobody knows what to expect from that. And I think that's, that's appropriate because we simply don't have enough information yet to know where our holes are and, and what we need to react to. Um, I'm just gonna ask Brian to comment just quickly. Brian works in my office and understands this thing on a, on a highly technical level. Uh, Brian, is there anything that you would want our small businesses to know or be aware of, or, or would you alter anything that I've, the advice I've just given? No, thank you, Congressman, not at all. Uh, I, I would just say, I, I think Congress right now is trying to figure out how to implement all three of these bills. These are massive uh, bills. The first one um, uh, amounted to $8 billion, the second $100 billion, and this one $2.2 trillion. So um, I think uh, the Treasury and, and the Department of Labor are trying to figure out in the, in the second um, bill, there was a paid leave requirement for businesses under 500 employees. Um, they're trying to figure out how to uh, make sure that the, the employers that are obligated to make those payments um, can, can get the uh, advanced tax credits to make sure that they don't, um, that they, they aren't uh, put out of business because um, of these additional requirements. And so uh, they're, they're working right now to really, uh, working really hard to try to um, implement, the, uh, implement uh, that, that part of the bill. And, um, and I think uh, it, it, to me, it sounds like congressional leadership wants to kind of wait and see and, and, and make sure that uh, the money that is uh, that was appropriated for these small business loans is being used um, properly and, and for those purposes. So, so we've heard a lot about the SBA loans, um, the, the EIDL, which you can get a $10,000 grant basically for just applying. Um, and then you can borrow, but there's, there's, there's not a forgiveness clause on that one. And then the, the payroll protection plan where you can get forgiveness um, if you spend it on the right things, rent and, and payroll, and you, can, and you can get up to two and a half times your monthly payroll. And, and there's a lot of nuanced questions about that, questions for venture back companies, which if you haven't seen a venture back company can apply for these loans. There is a question about control, how much of your company is controlled by a venture group or a private equity group but you are eligible for these loans, so you should be looking into them. But can you tell us, um, on, uh, let, let, before we move off the, the, two S, the, the, two, the two SBA products, so to speak, how fast do you think that money is going to go? Has there been any discussion about how long the stimulus that was approved will last in terms of supporting those two loan programs? Are you, are you referring to, um how long that money will be available or what, what it was intended? Well, it's, it's 350 billion. Right. And, and, and were, were there any discussions in Congress about what, what that, how long that lasts? I mean, we don't, we don't know um, how quickly that will go. Do you have any? I, I'm smiling because you're giving us way too much credit. <laughs> um, let, let's be truthful. This was, um, this is what happens when it takes 100 senators and 443 uh, congressmen to come together on something in hours, like literally hours, without knowing the, the scope of the damage, without knowing the duration of the damage. Um, we don't today, we don't still don't have answers to that. How long will we be asked to stay in our homes? We, we don't know that. So Congress has done really the best that they could do with, without knowing really all of these objectives. As those things come to light, as we start seeing um, uh, either improvement or, or worsening of the curve, right? As, as we see the economic viability of this country and how quickly we're able to handle this, you'll see Congress respond again. And I believe in that same bipartisan fashion. Between now and then, you're going to see the typical Washington DC bickering. 
Uh, does that make sense? And, and posturing. And yeah. uh, that's unfortunate, but that's, that's a reality. And um, we just need more information. It would be very foolish of us, for instance, to say, well, let's meet again and put more money into these two categories because people are worried we're going to run out. Well, we haven't even started dispersing of the money. Um, and here again, I'll go to this Costco line for toilet paper, right? And, um, and I'd also you know, just really urge and, and, and uh, ask people, yes, get in line, take what you need, don't take a penny more, right? Because if we use the same hoarding mentality, there's not enough money in all the world uh, to deal with this. Businesses need to be very responsible and realize every dollar they take is a dollar another business is not, is not getting. And, and we need to appeal to the best of us, which we're seeing in many, many cases around. The Congress simply does not have the information now to start forward with the fourth bill. I think that's a great point. Um, going back to the stimulus package that was passed, Brian uh, or Congressman Curtis, can you give us any, there's been so much focus on these SBA programs. There, I know there's some payroll uh, tax protection there. There's a few other things. Can you just touch on those specifics? Yeah, Brian, well, you hit that just kind of at a high level. And, and even, you know, for instance, the hospital piece of this and, and maybe just a super high level, the, the different components of this. Um, yeah, absolutely. Uh, so, so the hospital piece, there's uh, $100 billion that is appropriated set aside for um, any non-reimbursable health care expenses uh, for different provider groups, um, critical access hospitals, uh, rural health care clinics. Um, larger hospital systems, and, and they'll be able to apply to the um, ap apply to the Department of Health and, and Human Services for a grant. Um, they'll uh, they'll put out an RFP and, and um, be you know awarded money depending on uh, depending on um, depending on the, the criteria uh, them them meeting criteria that are in those grants. And, and the purpose of that is just to make sure that um, any you know any healthcare systems that have been totally disrupted because of COVID-19, which is pretty much any healthcare system, are able to recoup some of those or offset some of those losses. Um, and, and then with, with the payroll, uh, what, um, what, what, which specific criteria are, would you like to, um, or kind of some of the components of the bill? Just give us a quick sort of, what are the, what are the high points on other, you know, there, we, on, on any tax uh, relief that is being, was a part of that bill for small businesses? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, it's, a, it's a great question. There are um, there are opportunities for the way the way I kind of view the the bill is um, it, the the tax code is kind of working in conjunction with these SBA loans and these loan programs um, in the sense that uh, if you really kind of if you're an employer and, and maybe you aren't hurting as, as badly as some other employers and, and you have the the liquidity and you don't want to um, go further into debt or go into debt. Um, you can uh, you can use the tax code to, um, to to offset some losses. For example, uh, you can defer payroll taxes for up to two years uh, through 2022. Employer side payroll taxes. Um, okay. If you're and it's pricing there, because these that's a very important technical point. So any business is it any business? Yeah, it's it's any business. Any business can defer payroll tax from when to when? from now through 2022. And, th and that is um, employer side payroll taxes. Employer side payroll taxes. Yep. That's important. So if you're listening, be sure you're contacting your accountant um, and taking uh, or your or your PEO uh, company, etc. And taking action on that quickly so that you can capture those savings. Good. Keep going, Brian. Yeah. Um, what's what's really unique about that too, is that includes self employed individuals. So that's 12 points, it's almost 13% um, in, in payroll taxes that they could, that they could, uh, that they would be able to defer. Um, the first, the first uh, of those payments, the first half of those payments would have to be paid by, um, I believe it's March of 2021. And then the second half would be have to, would have to be paid by March of 2022. So they accrue, they accrue. They do it. Yes, they accrue. Yep. But, but they're delayed. That's great. What, what, what can you tell us about loss? Because there, there is, um, I understand that the stimulus bill includes a provision for businesses to be able to backdate loss. Is that correct? That is correct. Um, and that's kind of an interesting, that, that's a unique component too, because um, when the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act passed, uh, actually 
um, it actually uh, uh, prohibited this, this the, uh, I guess, uh, prohibited businesses from carrying back losses for a period of five years um, to offset some losses that they might be feeling, um, you know, current, currently feeling. And um, so this bill would allow companies to uh, carry back losses um, from 2018, 2019, and 2020, five years. Amazing. So if you had some real profitable years and you want to take some losses back to those years, you can get a, an additional refund. That could be really meaningful to some of these businesses. Yeah. Um, and, and do you happen to know how quickly that can happen? Uh, do, do you have to refile a return? I, I don't even know. I'm not an expert in this. Um, that, that's a good question. Uh, as I understand it, you would have to, um, you could open up your, your previous, your, your returns from previous years as you work with the IRS to do that. Um, and, and they would, I, I think on the back end, they would be able to help you assist you with, um, determining how much, uh, how much or how little you would carry back, uh, depending on, um, depending on your current situation. Excellent. Anything else that you think is technical, technical or tactical, like that, that that young companies should be thinking about right now. Yeah, on, on the on the tax side. Sorry, Congressman Curtis. Go ahead, Brian. You finish, and I'll, I'll I'll just add a thought before you move on. Anything uh, that this last stimulus bill that you think is may maybe small in comparison to the SBA loans and might might have been sort of hidden in the shadows that these young companies should be aware of that is beneficial. Um, not, uh, not anything that I can, not anything in addition to what we've already covered that I can think of. Um, but, uh, I, 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 you know, as, as we learn a little bit more about these programs, cause they're such, you know, they the bills are massive. Um, I, I'd be more than happy to share that with you. Excellent. Congressman Curtis, did you have something? I just wanted to make a, a pitch, uh, for getting feedback to us, um, as we do shape the next bill, there will be a next bill. We just don't know it'll be in it. Your feedback is incredible. What did we miss? What could we have done better? I had a gentleman reach out to me and he gave me a marvelous idea. And that is, let's remember opportunity zones, the tax benefit that we gave opportunity zones. Let's give that same tax benefit to people who give money to small businesses. Absolutely. It doesn't cost the government a penny, right? And, and so we've actually introduced the bill in the house to do exactly that. And by getting these ideas in, they shape the legislation coming. So really encourage uh, everybody that's listening today to funnel up those ideas to us uh, that could be helpful when the next bill is addressed. I, I think that's so critical. I mean, we, we, the, the, the recent bill seems to, in a, in, in a, in a little bit of a way, slightly does, doesn't, it, well, slightly penalizes venture capital and private equity a, a little bit. And, um, it's just so critical that we release that private equity uh, venture capital into the market again. And you know, the United Kingdom did a program uh, several years ago, back to, to uh, into the early 2000s, where they they basically gave you an abatement from any capital gains tax if you invested into technology and science, and it fueled tremendous investment. And I think that if at the state level, the local level, um, and the federal level, if we were looking at how we reduce the risk to venture capitalists. They've had a great ride and you know, no question that it's been a, a really good decade for venture, but the, the whole world has just changed. And it would, it would just do such a tremendous thing to Utah if uh, folks coming, maybe losing their job, could have an avenue where they could start a business and they could get funding and start building something. This, this tragedy and crisis does present tremendous market opportunity there are lots of companies, I've, I've just seen several companies that have just started to try to uh, address needs that now exist because of uh, COVID-19. So um, really encourage you to do that. And, and I, we have a lot of people, John, that would love to weigh in on that. I know that, um, that Album, uh, Peterson, Mercado, uh, Kickstart, all these companies that, that have been putting lots of seed funding in uh, would really like to do that. And I'm curious, um, uh, President Adams or uh, Mayor Mendenhall, do you think that in the venture space that the state or the city could do anything to help on that front? Uh, again, I think that's a great idea. And before I actually answer that question, I just wanted to say thank you. As I see this group here, this is probably the, the biggest issue that I'll face in my lifetime. And, uh, you know, probably we may face in any of our lifetimes. And you see the congressional level, you see the federal level, 
you see the state and the city and the private sector all in, in, in one, on one call trying to figure this out. So yes, a part of the efforts we're gonna use, and if I, as we talk about it maybe later on, is what we're gonna do in the session. And, and that will focus on trying to mitigate this problem, trying to find a way to, to keep, keep businesses going. But I think the state is very interested and that, that's something we'll look at. Excellent. Uh, we, we, the venture capital and private equity sector, and, and that includes a lot of individuals who have invested in companies, not just uh, firms and institutions, but Utah has been blessed with, you know, a lot of um, people that, that are successful, they'll put, you know, a couple hundred thousand dollars a year into new companies, and we really want that to continue. And if we can increase the potential upside to those, those folks, it'd be a huge, huge deal. Um, uh, Mayor Mendenhall, um, your thoughts on this and, and also on what, what the city is doing right now and state of play. Thanks. I'll echo the president and thanking you for organizing this uh, multifaceted government conversation where we can get into the weeds, which is my favorite kind of government conversation. Um, locally, I think municipalities uh, don't necessarily have the overarching ability that our, our president of the Senate and Congressman Stewart might have in being able to defer capital gains, for example, and connect venture capital uh, dollars with new business startups. But one thing that we can work more tangibly with as a city is, um, in which I'm, I'm fascinated to see how it unravels, is this massive shift to teleworking and how in a downtown capital city such as ours, businesses that occupy a great deal of square footage in our downtown buildings are going to reassess that square footage and the rent and the lease payments that they make to keep those employees Tell in their building. So that. I'm excited and interested working with my economic development team to say, how could the city perhaps step into newly vacated which we, of course we don't know yet, but um, space in the city as we are passionately working toward building the tech sector, biotech, life sciences out in Salt Lake City proper. And one of those hurdles to starting up a business is accessing space. Uh, and there's a lot of those businesses that need wet lab space and you know we really need to get people into work. Um, so that's something that we're going to be exploring, and I think uh, it's one of those silver linings of potential that we are hoping to drive a wedge right into and open up in an even bigger way than we could have imagined before COVID-19, the opportunity for uh, life sciences and the tech sector to thrive in Salt Lake City proper. But can I tell you a little bit about some of the details wonderful. we're working on? Can I just, can I just comment, uh, Mayor Mendenhall, that's wonderful. We have tremendous actually biotech and life sciences companies in Utah who've almost kind of been kept in the shadows because of some of the stuff happening in tech more broadly, but uh, they've really stepped out into the daylight because of this crisis and have, have shown that they're really critical to this economy and candidly to saving lives in Utah right now. So wonderful, Absolutely. I'd really love to hear that. And, and of course we would be happy to collaborate in any way that we can. Thanks. What they are critical, and they're, uh, these companies are going to be critical to our resiliency and our recovery, economic speaking, um, after this, not just in creating the tools for us to get through it. But Salt Lake City Economic Developments did a survey that we started, uh, I think, before anyone else in the state was asking businesses, how are you experiencing this impact? And we have heard from um, well over 500 businesses in Salt Lake City proper at this point. We know that 60% uh, of the businesses who have responded have experienced a 90 to 100% revenue loss in the last three weeks. Um, there's 17,000 licensed businesses in Salt Lake City proper, and 90% of those are small businesses, 50 or fewer employees. So it, we very quickly put together a million dollar fund for uh, loans that was meant to be a stopgap as we wait for these federal dollars to come through and the SBA dollars to be accessible. We knew that there were, um, there were business owners out there who needed to pay rent, uh, pay their payroll. And so we opened up the first 500,000 about a week ago, those checks have been going out electronically now to wow. 26 businesses. And now that last 500,000 um, of the first million dollars we've put toward it is being decided upon Monday and Tuesday of next week. And that's a 0% interest 20 year, I'm sorry, five year and 
no one needs to begin repayments until 90 days after the emergency declaration has finished. Uh, so we're excited about that. And we've been working with other cities around the state to figure out how they could put such a tool together. Wow, that, that's terrific. Um, that's, and it, it really is timely because it looks like um, these federal funds, we're hoping we'll start to see some flow of cash this next week. But you know, there's a lot of technical things still being worked out behind the scenes. So good timing on getting, getting that to businesses quickly. Erin, can I mention one other tool that we've put together as a city? Yeah. Uh, and I know that it might not apply to some of the folks tuning in that are related to tech businesses, but the food and beverage industry is a giant part of our local economy. Uh, it employs 15,000 people just in Salt Lake City. And we know looking at the state's Department of Workforce Services numbers that of the, well, it was almost 29,000 people filed for unemployment last week. Um, in the state of Utah, and about 30, <clears throat> excuse me, 37% of those are food and beverage employees. So they're, they're really the first ones to get hit, and they'll probably be the last ones to come back to work. And we were grateful to hear from Salt Lake resident Ty Burrell, who's an actor on Modern Family, and he and his wife also co-own uh, Bar X and a, a few other bars and, relate, and restaurants in the city. They put $100,000 out there uh, to go directly to employees of food and beverage. Uh, and these are in uh, 2000, we're trying to get it to a $2,000 grant program at this point with the amount of funding we have, which is just over 200,000 now, thanks to the contributions of many others. It's about a $500 grant. It's a grant, obviously you don't have to repay it. And um, that's another program that we are sharing with cities around the state. We've invested about a hundred hours of labor from Salt Lake Economic Development to put this tool together with our Downtown Alliance. And we're happy to share that. So it, I think it applies to food and beverage at this point, but it could apply to any industry. And if people are interested in that, they can reach out to Salt Lake City Economic Development and we'll share that tool package with them. And maybe I could share another idea. Uh, shortly, we're gonna have a, a probably a special session for the legislature. and. What, a, what great programs. I appreciate the federal programs in the city and, and we'll probably work on some things with the state. We, we may take a little different approach, you know, as we're, we're in this battle, I, I, probably a significant battle against this virus. Uh, you know, one of the things you do when you're, you're in that type of situation is you look around to try to learn from others. Government of Cuomo, they're probably in the thick of this, probably more so than any other state. I was very impressed with something he said and when somebody asked him if he'd do anything differently. He said, yes, I would. And he said, what we did is we actually shut down and, and everything. And we actually treated tall people, short people, old people, young people, everyone the same. And he said, I would have targeted what I had done a little differently. And so as, as we're looking at this, I think you'll see a special session I learned something the other day that some people are actually immune, that they can't be infected. There's something inside of the metabolism that, that keeps them from getting the virus. There are other people that have had the virus and they're actually got antibodies and we're treating them the same, asking them to, to stay at home and not function. But these people could actually be great assets to our healthcare uh, facilities to actually help. And then we're actually seeing testing come out and, Somebody talked about a test and, and we're working on it, a 15 minute test. And if you could test somebody in 15 minutes, I don't think that's anything new you haven't heard of. I mean, you may be able to have somebody tested and have the beautician be tested and have somebody actually go get their hair done because they've, they've got an armband on, they've been tested, they don't have the virus, but actually to lift things up and get people back at work because no matter what we do, trying to backfill and, and fill in these the small businesses that, that they really want to go to work. They don't want federal or, or city or state money. They actually want to work. And, and, and when you look at the economics of it, there probably isn't enough money in, in any of our coffers to be able to backfill what the private sector does. So in this special session, I think you'll see us maybe try to move forward and try, and try to push and get people back at work and, and do it safely because none of us want to do it in a way that would actually further the spread. You know, I'm really excited to see Test Utah going in, out in place. Yeah. Give, give a quick synopsis on that. Just where do people go to figure that out and how many tests are available and, um, 
and where they can get it. You know, you should be getting a survey right now, and hopefully everybody's got one in their email. Actually, fill out the survey, and if you and they'll they'll rate you. I think uh, green, yellow, red, and black, and and they'll actually tell you where to go get the test if you feel like you need one. And uh, and I think that'll be a, a great thing to have happen. I've actually uh, coincidentally have friends in Idaho, and this morning they saw Test Utah roll out, and they called and said how do we get this for Idaho? I mean, this could be a, a process. And, and in my mind, you see a lot of small companies out there, small tech companies. The solution to this problem we're facing are those small tech companies that can help us find a solution to this huge problem that we're facing. And again, there, no, one, no one can do it better than, than the tech companies. And actually we can get people back to work if we, if we actually focus on that. Absolutely. Um... It, it, let me just say, if you're listening, you should be checking out www.testutah.com. Um, that's one of the one of the ways you can get tested, not the only way, just so everybody's clear. And you can do up to, they're going to be doing up to 500 tests a day with a 24 to 48 hour response time. They've set up two locations, I think one in Provo and one in Orem, but they're moving to other locations now along the Wasatch Front primarily. And uh, this is a public-private partnership that's been pushed actually through Silicon Slopes and a startup named Nomi Health and, and several other startups and tech companies, Domo, Qualtrics, uh, multiple parties. But it's a really great example of public-private partnership and innovation happening right now. Yeah, Mark Newman at Nomi Health has been phenomenal. And, you know, when I was in school, I may not have been very smart. When I got a, I got a question I didn't know the answer to, there usually was a multiple choice question, A, B, C, D, or all the above. I checked all the above, and I think that's what we need to do with this problem is look at all the above. And there's some, well, after you find out and you get your test and, and we actually are able to, to maybe encapsulate the people you've, you've associated with and try to, and try to you know, as best we can to, to, to treat those people or to find the people that have been maybe exposed. Uh, there are potentially some treatments. I mean, we've heard about the, the malaria drug uh, uh, and hydrochloroquine, and we've heard about uh, remdesivir, which is a new drug that's being developed at University of Utah. Before the 60s, and Congressman, I'll just tell you, before the 1960 period of time, the FDA only had to prove safety. And after the Congress passed a bill, they had to prove safety and effect, efficacy, if it, if it, if it works. And in a, the middle of a, a crisis, maybe we ought to go back and say, if a drug is safe, maybe we ought to allow it to be used. And, and I'm not talking just about the malaria drug, but there's so many other treatments that people are coming out there with plasma and other things that perhaps in, a, in this, in this uh, very difficult period of time, we need to uh, save lives the best way we can. So you'll probably see some of that talk during the special legislative session too. Marion, could I jump in and talk about rent? for a moment. I think that um, that applies no matter who you are, what industry you work in, uh, whether you're employed or unemployed at this point. And it's important for us to uh, recognize and thank the Congressman for um, the CARES Act that puts you know $2 trillion out there. And it, if you make $75,000 or less based on your last tax filing, you'll be getting a $1,200 check in the mail uh, plus $500 per child. Uh, it's a one time, obviously. And then yesterday, I think it was yesterday, the days begin to blur together. The governor announced a, a rent deferment until May 15th. That doesn't mean that you don't ever have to pay that rent for the month of April or the first part of the month of May, but that you can catch up on it later. So I just wanted to throw those out there. There's more details on Salt Lake City Economic Development's website too. Aaron, uh, Mayor Mendenhall, do you happen to know, it, does that apply to um, anybody, the deferment, or does it apply to people who have lost their jobs and uh, or who may have tested positive? It applies to anyone. It applies to all Utahns. And then of course, there were some um, additional measures put in place for mortgage holders, uh, Fannie and Freddie. And that's, now we're speaking above my pay grade, so. Brian, can you tell us any anything about the mortgage uh, deferment or abatement that came through the federal or, or, or Congressman Curtis, either one of you? Brian, I'll defer to you on that. 
Okay. Um, I, I uh, admittedly, I apologize. I, um, I have another colleague in the office who's been following those issues more closely, but I do know that there are some um, significant, uh, I think there are some significant, um, uh, there's a lot of money that is going toward um, helping uh, uh, landlords, uh, mom and pop landlords that are participating in the, in the community um, uh, housing block grant program um, to try to help them offset some of the, the losses that they might be feeling temporarily uh, by, you know, uh, because of deferred um, rent payments um, or, or mortgage payments. But um, I, uh, Arian, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to, I'm happy to um, send any additional information to you if, if that's helpful. And um, I yeah. think it's really important for young. So if you're, if you're, if you have, I have, I have 20 employees in my company and I want to make sure that they understand what options are available to them as well and to their loved ones. So um, the rent abatement or the rent deferment rather is really valuable and important to companies or individuals who've, who've lost income. And then also the Freddie Mac Fannie Mae loan programs. I'm assuming the best thing is to contact your, your mortgage lender. Just like we've actually, yeah, we've actually talked about uh, helping out with a rent abatement, but actually not abatement. We've actually talked about it as, and nothing's been actually firmed up, but, but our thought was if you, if you abate the rent, then the landlord has, doesn't receive the money and then they can't make their mortgage payments. So we've actually looked at it as a state. We think if there needs to be help for rent, that we'd actually take maybe some of the stimulus money and, and actually fund that rent so it filters through and, and takes care of the, the challenges those that are renting have, also helps the landlord pay their mortgage payment and uh, helps the bank who, who doesn't see a landlord default on his mortgage payment. So we think that's a better program. I might throw in too a couple of thoughts. One is, I think that's one of the things Congress had in mind with individual payments um, going out to individuals that that would be used for rent. The other thing is just to be so super clear that um, you could be making the problem worse for yourself if you if you are not paying your rent and doubling up on that rent payment or tripling up on that rent payment a few months later may be a bigger problem than right now. Yeah. I would love to see everybody not on, on break, right? The credit bureaus are still doing their work. Yes, yeah. I would love to see everybody who's having a problem call their landlord and, and work with them. And, and I think you'll find the landlords very willing to work with you in structuring payments or, 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 or waiving late fees and, and those types of things. That's the real power is that phone call to your landlord and, and, a, and a thoughtful dialogue about how do we both win in this uh, situation? Because let's face it, the vast majority of people we're talking about are good tenants who have paid for years and will pay for years and have a month to two month to three month problem. I just want to add to that, uh, Congressman Curtis. You kind of touched on the importance of not hoarding, um, not not hoarding uh, uh, toilet paper, and it, the same applies on this. If if you are in pain, if you've lost your income, go for it. If you if you have income, you know, do your part by by uh, by by continuing to make your payments and being a good citizen that way, right? Um, let, let's just go back to President Adams. President Adams, can you give us a quick view of, the, there, there is, as I understand it, the, there is a surplus, a budget sur surplus, or there was a budget surplus, if you can help us understand that. And what, what is the state looking to do in terms of stimulus in the next legislative session? What are the topics being discussed? Well, you know, we, we had a surplus, and I think that's probably the, the key term, but we've actually prepared the state very well for this downturn. Uh, there's two actually types of money that we have. One is money that's in our savings account, which is one time, and the other is ongoing money, which would be like your paycheck. We've got a lot of ongoing money that we've spent on one-time expenses, and we'll probably start bringing that money off those one-time expenses and trying to fund uh, different, actually keep the state going. Some of the things we've talked about are, are again, trying to deal with uh, people's problems with their rent. We've actually seen uh, businesses have the same problem, you know, as, as businesses are told not to open and, and closed and actually boarded up. There's, there's maybe uh, some help that needs to be, be given to those, those retailers who maybe sales taxes drop 50% or as, as uh, Mayor Mendenhall said, 90% of their income has gone away that maybe there's some rent assistance for those businesses too. 
So we'll be looking at this, and I think as best we can. We don't have the resources the federal government. We have to balance our budget, but we'll be looking for ways to to actually not only uh, backfill, but to see, find ways to get the economy going again. And and that's probably as, as you listen to listen to Governor Cuomo. Somehow we've got to be able to do both, and that's what he said. We have to do both. We have to do both. We have to find a way because this thing isn't as short term as I think we might think it is. But we're this we're in for this for the long haul. And somehow while we have to find a way to social distance, allow businesses to function, and allow our economy to get back going. Um, two two quick questions. One. Uh, my comment about the credit bureaus has kicked off a number of questions online, which is, is, is there anything being considered, and I would assume this has to be state or federal, around a pause in credit so, so people who really can't pay or really are dealing with something are not ruining their credit? It's a good question that's come up. Do you have any, any response on that? Uh, Con Congressman Chris. Go ahead, uh, Senator. No, no, I'm, I'll follow you. Uh, Congressman Chris Stewart um, worked hard to get into our bill uh, some protection from uh, the credit agencies, some type of a block. And, and speaking with him, he's confident he did that. I've not seen that in, in the text, and we'll look for that, and Brian and I will try to get back to you. But that, that is a conversation on a federal level. Here again, you've got the same concept where you've got people who for, for decades have been good payers and will be good decades payers for good years. If we ding their credit, all we're doing, going to do is hurt the economy in, in those situations. So we'll, we'll follow up and see if we get some more information on the federal level. Yeah, I would say on the state level, we're, we're seeing talk about deferment car registrations because you have to go out and get your uh, per, per, potentially an emissions inspection and going to do that, you don't know whether you can get that done. We're hearing obviously the deferment of the state tax payment because the federal government did that. We're hearing def deferment in, and actually speeding up of the employment uh, benefits so we can, we can take care of those type of uh, challenges. I haven't heard about credit unions, but that's a new one that uh, not credit, um, credit reports, not credit unions. And uh, that's a new issue that I haven't heard uh, concern about, but I wouldn't be surprised if that was uh, talked about. Let, let's go to Mayor Mendenhall for a moment. Mayor, what, what are the next things on your agenda locally? Um, and what do you see coming next? And we, we know that you have a hard stop and I think we'll end this at 1220. So we've got about seven minutes left um, on the call. Thanks. We've issued uh, six proclamations to date, which is over the course of about three weeks. I think it just goes to show that we're learning as we go. We're taking the best data and information that we can through our partners at the County Health Department as they do the modeling and work, work with the hospital systems. 80 to 90% of all of the hospital beds in the state of Utah are in Salt Lake County. And I know that this will be slow to spread to the rural areas, but it will spread to the rural areas. And when it does, and when this is truly recognized as the statewide issue that it is, and it is becoming, uh, it's going to be the critical care needs uh, within the metropolitan areas like Salt Lake County that serve those state needs. So you know that we've put in place a stay at home mandate as a county and uh, the city supports that and tried to go as far as as we could in bringing the state along with that. But we still only have five counties in the state of Utah that have issued a stay at home mandate. And it's time, in my opinion, that we get on board as a statewide community in doing everything we can to slow that spread so that when it does spread, we can truly serve the patients that we're going to have to serve as the majority holder of that care and services for the state of Utah. So that work is ongoing. And I think really convincing people of the science and the, and the data that's out there is a day-to-day -day job. So I'm happy to do it. Um, and we want people to come back to Salt Lake City. We want to fill our streets uh, with the fun and culture and art that we normally do. And so we will be waiting and ready to jump um, in inviting everybody back to Salt Lake City for work and for play. And, and Mayor Mendenhall, m many probably don't realize it, but the, the airport, the Salt Lake City Airport is under uh, the control of the city. And it is such a crucial lifeline uh, of business. I mean, it's, it's a bloodline for business, I guess we'd say. Can you tell us anything about the airport, what's happening there, 
and sure. how uh, what people can just anticipate about travel in and out of Utah. Yeah, we have put some of the proclamations have addressed restrictions at the airport, which, as you mentioned, the city owns. Uh, we have put into place limits on only if you have a ticket or an airport badge, can you enter the airport itself? If you need help and physical accommodations, one person can help someone um, in that regard. But we have a dramatic cut in just flights and people on those flights. Normally we would see about 25,000 people come through the doors of the airport in one day. And today that's about 2,500 people. Uh, we still are building our brand new airport, which is set to open its first uh, phase in the main terminal this coming September. We have about 1,800 employees coming to work and building that airport every day. Now that's not even the normal airport functions. That's just the construction crews who are at work there. And so we are working uh, with some of the people you've mentioned on this call today to get testing in place for both our employees at the airport and people deplaning from hotspots around the country. I think we've heard about other states addressing their borders and, and doing temperature checks or random checks at the state borders. I see the airport like a belly button. It is a, it's a vulnerable opening to our state for the transmission of this disease. And we know that it, it was through people traveling that it, COVID arrived here initially. Um, so that is a, it's a major focus for us. That's absolutely something we are actively working on even right after this call. I have to hop on something about that. Well, let's do one minute final thoughts. And since Aaron, you have got a real quick hard stop coming up. Why don't you give us your one minute final thought? Uh, I'll go on the humanitarian side of this. And I think as we're all getting restless with however many weeks you've been in uh, quarantine or you've been trying to stay home, people are restless and we, it's hard to not know when it's going to end. I think it becomes ever more important for us to remember why we're doing this. We're doing this to save lives. We're doing this to save the lives of your coworkers, of your neighbors, of your family. It is very serious. And the pinch that we feel right now is less than the pinch that we will feel economically or from a public health perspective if we don't take these measures now. So please have patience, social grace with each other while we practice social distancing. And this is a defining time for us as a statewide and a local community. It shows who we really are. And at this point, I am really proud of Salt Lakers and the kindness they're showing one another while we go through this. Well, the response to your comments uh, are, are really getting a lot of comments on, on the YouTube channel. So thank you. Uh, thank you for your leadership, Mayor Mendenhall. Thanks and for having me today. Good to see you all. President Adams, uh, final thoughts. Again, thank you for having me, but I think our future's bright. You know, even in this challenge, I see that in, in America or in Utah, it doesn't feel like we give up. And one of the bright spots is, and one of the most exciting things I've seen is yesterday, again, when we rolled out Test Utah. And we see the different testing models that, that I explained earlier, if you can get a 15 minute test, I believe in the, in, the, in the face of adversity, Americans, Utah, step up and solve problems. And I think we're gonna solve this problem, whether it be a, a, you know, some type of drug or, or medicine or a, vi or a vaccine. I think our future, we're gonna get through this. And I think our future is bright, even as perhaps challenging as what it might be. And I think we're gonna to continue to work until we solve this. So, I, I actually thank the, the small business people here because I think they're going to be part of this problem and, and welcome their ideas and their thoughts because when you give the when you give the private sector a set of parameters as to what they can do and how they what the, the things we need to do not to spread this virus and let them go to work you're going to see small businesses actually come forward to try to help solve it so thank you thank you president Adams and good luck with the next legislative session we'll all be looking to um, the leadership uh, coming from that house to Thank give you. us uh, give us the next set of hope for this for the businesses small businesses here in Utah, um, Congressman Curtis. Uh, I just want to say I took a lovely walk in Rock Canyon, which you helped to preserve when you were mayor of Provo, and Utah has has such abundant beauty, and we're just grateful that this season is giving us a lot of uh, beautiful vistas, um, despite the discouraging news uh, in some other. Uh, ways, but you, the the leadership that's been shown, and quite frankly, the um, the unity that has occurred in Washington, in a way, has been very encouraging, and we really appreciate the fast response. 
any final thoughts you have on what's coming next and uh, any words of hope? So thank you. Uh, thanks for doing this. And thanks for bringing up Rock Canyon. My best to your mom. Um, that's who we really have to thank uh, for that beautiful canyon. Um, it's funny as I, we're sitting here, I'm looking out my window and literally on my mind is I got to get to Rock Canyon because that's, that's where I get my peace and solitude. Uh, let me just say this. We've all been in bad storms and uh, this is a bad storm. And uh, when you're in your bad storm, you just keep thinking like, is it over right? Is it getting better? Is it getting better? And every morning I wake up and I kind of look at the, the, the numbers and things to see if the storm's getting better. This much we know, the storm will pass. There is another side to this and it is bright. And, 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 and the encouragement that I see is in the minds of the people working on this problem, the people working on the humanitarian side of this, the people working on creative uh, ways to make our life better in the middle of this. And there's just no doubt in my mind, we will get through this storm, we'll get to the other side, and we'll be better having gone through this storm uh, on the other side. It's just a little painful uh, while we're in the middle of it. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you to the over 250 um, live participants and what will likely be several thousand who will see this recording in the coming days. We really appreciate the leadership that's being shown from the government. I think it's become very clear that we need to be politically active in, um, in both our city, state, and federal governments and elections, uh, several of which are coming up later this, this year. And we are, we're grateful that we have good government and that we can, uh, we can stay connected. So we hope everybody stays well and stays connected and wishing you all a very good Friday. Thank you.